From the tiniest stream to the greatest ocean, water is our most precious ally. But it can also be our worst enemy. Serene waters and quiet creeks can quickly become raging rivers bent on death and destruction. In southwestern British Columbia, halfway between the Whistler Ski Resort and West Vancouver, is the tiny community of Britannia Beach, once home to the richest copper mine in the province. In 1915, Britannia Beach is a typical company town, born of and totally dependent on the copper mine above it. Everything is owned by the Britannia Mining and Smelting Company. The company was very parental in nature in many respects. We had all sorts of things uh, uh, constructed for social purposes, i.e. a community hall, a gymnasium, tennis courts, swimming pools, and uh, also during the summertime we had a good softball field. By March, the mining operation is in full swing. One of its underground surveyors is a young man named Carlton Browning. This is his first job since graduating mining school less than a year earlier. March 22, 1915. As midnight approaches, most residents in the mining camp above the beach are asleep. It's a congested site that includes crew bunkhouses, single family units, and a school. The first indication that there was a problem was the uh, the lights had gone off the powerhouse down at the 2200 level so they realized something drastic had happened up there. High above the camp a mass of snow, rock and mud gives way. It was unexpected uh, you know it's just one of those unfortunate situations where you've got a heavy rainfall and a wet snowpack and down it came right through the camp. The debris flow swept right through the middle of the camp. Uh, there were bunkhouses, there were houses, there were uh, other buildings that were just totally destroyed, broken up into bits and pieces, most of them covered up with debris. The slide takes only a few minutes, but leaves 57 dead and 22 injured. Survivor Carlton Browning can see that the seaside community down below is safe. The next time disaster strikes, however, Britannia Beach and Carlton Browning will not be so lucky. Friday, October 28, 1921. In the six years since the 1915 slide, Carlton Browning has become superintendent of the mine. He has also had a hand in the construction of a new town site on Britannia Mountain. There was always a community at the beach, but about three or four kilometers up the Britannia Creek Valley was uh, another town site. And in the latter years, it became known as the Mount Shear town site. The beach community has enjoyed substantial growth of its own, including the construction of a new mill, new homes, and a six-story company store. By 1921, there are several dams above and below the Mount Shear town site. The largest is the Tunnel Dam near the mine entrance, providing water for the mine, the mill, and the two communities. 1921 would have been the beginning of the very productive years for the mining operation here. Some of the earlier hurdles were over with, and we were getting into large tonnage production and most of the infrastructure was complete and built. One hurdle that Carlton Browning feels he has overcome is the huge railway embankment behind the tunnel dam. Built from waste rock from the mine, it provides a foundation for rail lines going across Britannia Creek. During heavy runoff, the embankment often holds back more water than the concrete dams below it. 
Superintendent Browning orders the construction of a wooden culvert, creating a tunnel through the embankment to improve water flow. The box culvert is just a, a, a square opening to allow the creek to pass through. And in this case, the box culvert was constructed out of large timber in the bottom of uh, Britannia Creek. On this particular Friday, it appears to be working well as runoff from the swollen creek rushes through. By day's end, it will be the catalyst for a disaster that no one in Britannia Beach could ever imagine. Friday, October 28, 1921. It has been raining hard all night, and water is already flooding yards in the community of Britannia Beach. There was a relatively heavy snowpack in October, further up Mount Shear. There were extremely heavy rains in the order of five and a half inches, six inches of rain on the Thursday night. So the creeks would just be roaring. On the beach, mine manager Edward Donahue notices that the bridge to the hospital is in danger of washing out. He orders a crew of men to protect it. Alexander McKenzie heads off to work the day shift at the nearby powerhouse. He looks forward to spending the evening at home with his wife and two daughters, Thelma and Kathleen. It was a very comfortable house, two bedrooms and a large kitchen, which was sort of the center of the family, and a small living room. And it was owned by the company. No one owned their own property or their house. Normally, Bob McKnight would be with his family, too. But they are on a trip to Vancouver, and he is staying at the local hotel. My father, he was in the beach proper. He was the electrical superintendent of the, of the, of the company, so he went out to work every morning at the crack of dawn. Swedish immigrants Johanna and Olaf Swanson have been in Britannia Beach since 1914. They have two teenage daughters, Greta and Hannah. My mother would have been 15 years of age and my aunt would have been 14 at the time. My mother was extremely musical, played um, violin beautifully, and her lessons as a youngster were taken at Britannia. Alan Stewart and his family have come all the way from Prince Edward Island to find work. Now, Alan works as a clerk in the Beach Community's company store. My father's job was to meet the boat and make sure that all the things that they were supposed to be getting were checked off. 38-year-old contractor Fred Downing has been hauling supplies to the upper town site. He hopes to catch that same boat back to Vancouver later that afternoon. Despite the rain, warm air causes packed snow to melt on the mountain slopes. At the upper town site, there is more water behind the railway embankment than all the dams below it. When logs and debris block the embankment's wooden culvert, Superintendent Carlton Browning sends men to clear it. The crew builds a large V-shaped guard in front of the culvert to prevent further jamming. The crew is happy with the increased water flow, but miner Vic Brister is alarmed by what he sees. The water was rushing to go through that hole so that some of it would eddy on each side and it would cut into the loose muck and just wash the muck out. I saw right away that the culvert was going to go out. Brister is so concerned that he warns family members who live in Britannia Beach, but does not speak to company officials. It was not my place to warn them. The company had men there looking after it, and I would not have been thanked if I'd said anything. As far as company officials are concerned, a warning is not necessary. Superintendent Browning is relieved to see the water levels behind the embankment drop during the afternoon. The water is still flowing well at 8.30 that evening. Then, the day's steady rain turns into a heavy downpour. Carlton Browning arranges for a detail of men to watch the bridges at Britannia Beach. 
James Emmett is at the furthest end of the beach, looking after a small footbridge. Pipe fitter Bert King is stationed close to the railway bridge at the base of the tracks. He can see James Emmett from where he stands. I thought I would take a walk over and see how he was getting on, being as the waters were pretty high. We could hardly hear anything but the roar of the creek. By Mr. Emmett's watch, a quarter to nine, he says to me, three more hours and we go home. Fred Downing has missed the afternoon boat and is staying at the home of friends Jack and Helen Godden. Not far away, mine electrician Bob McKnight has just returned to his hotel. He used to go to a friend's home once a week and have a bath. And he often stayed and played cards with them. But this night he decided, no, he'd go right home and take a hot drink and go to bed. And so when he got home, he did what he said he was going to do. But the lights went out. Friday, October 28th, 1921. In the small community of Britannia Beach, British Columbia, Mrs. Handel Hawkins walks home after her music lesson at the local movie hall. It is almost 9.30 p.m. Four kilometers up the mountain, not far from the town site known as Mount Shear, 14 million gallons of water have been building up behind a railway embankment. At 9.30 p.m., that embankment gives way. The debris flow started at the Mount Shear town site. So the Mount Shear town site itself was, was not affected, but all of that material came sweeping down the Britannia Creek Valley. People working underground wouldn't have known anything about it, and uh, people living on the creek would have heard this massive roar of water going by, and the people at the beach wouldn't have heard the, the flood coming. Mine superintendent Carlton Browning sees the huge flow roaring down the creek bed in a solid mass over six meters deep. I ran for the phone immediately. I saw a lot of timber and knew there was a condition that they needed warning of at the beach. It is already too late. The rush of water pours over the tunnel dam and scours the creek bed, taking trees, boulders, and debris with it. The water that broke in the first place it was above the dam. And then when it hit the dam, it just forced all the water that was in the dam out. It left all the junk that it brought down. And it moved all the muck and logs and everything else into the dam, and the water ran over. And there were two more dams down below, and the same thing happened there. So all of the water that came, it wasn't held up by the dam because they were full of debris. The flood surges down a walled canyon that inclines sharply 36 meters to the beach. The sudden drop causes the water mass to accelerate even more, splitting it in two. It was a steep, steep valley down to the flat fan, and just about at this point, it cut itself a new path right through an area that was covered with miners' cottages, the, the, the homes of the workers and their buildings. And from there, of course, it just spewed out. It, it spread out and covered a wide area. It's uh, just like aiming a, a hose at the town. It came straight out and just slaughtered the buildings. Watchman Bert King tries to warn James Emmett. I shouted to him, Jim, there is a flood! And I heard him holler. And that is the last I did hear of him, along with the crash of the buildings behind him. As power lines go down, Bob McKnight hurries outside. Daddy went out on the porch, but his feet began to get wet. So he, he stood up on the railing, which was maybe nine feet. Then the water came up to his feet. Mrs. Handel Hawkins tries to run, but is swept away by the rushing torrent. 
Olaf Swanson and his family find the powerful rush of water right at their doorstep. And they sort of were behind this huge oak round dining room table and my grandfather apparently picked my grandmother up and put her on the table and a log came crashing through the house and smacked into the um, pedestal of the dining room table and I was told that if it weren't for that dining room table probably there would have been fatalities within the family. The water forces the home of Alexander Mackenzie right off its foundation, pushing it towards Howe Sound and the open sea. I can remember vividly the feel of the house moving down to the sea. And I can see us to this day saying a prayer. And it was answered when the house hit a tree that hadn't been uprooted. And it really saved us because we were quite close to the ocean. Many of the Mackenzie's neighbors aren't so fortunate. The houses that were in the, the flood path were just absolutely shattered to pieces. And I know my aunt could remember children calling that were out in the houses that had been swept out into the sound. The rending of homes from their foundations actually saves the lives of Alan Stewart and his family. Next door to us on the east side was the school principal's house. And when the flood hit it, it knocked it off the foundation and sat it down right beside our house. So everything that came after that, all the flood water, hit the Smith's house and ours was protected. So when the water levels slackened off, then my father went out to see if he could help retrieve the people who were in trouble. Neighbor William Matheson is doing the same. Although their home is badly damaged, he and his wife are uninjured and are trying to help those in need. They were either uh, practically drowned or in the creek or, and had to be pulled out or they were pinned under debris and uh, had to be released where possible. Bob McKnight hurries to the home of a close friend and arrives just in time. This wall of the bedroom had been forced against the other wall and a little cripple was between the two walls and Daddy pulled little George Schooler out by his leg and everybody rejoiced with him. He was just an infant. Elizabeth Mitchell's mother and family are trapped in their house until a neighbor arrives to help. His name was Carl Berg. He tried to come and get them out of the house with his boat, but he couldn't get in. I guess the water was so high. So what they did was they went up into the attic, made a hole out into the roof, and Carl Berg went and got a ladder. And with the help of the ladder and Carl Berg and the boat, they survived. Some of the rescued aren't as lucky. One woman clings to a small puppy, the only other survivor of her entire family. Saturday, October 29th, 1921. What's left of Britannia Beach is mired in a mass of mud, rock, and logs. What leaps to my mind is the calmness of the ocean the next morning. The thing was perfectly calm as if nothing had happened, except you could see the houses floating around in the sound. People were being picked off from the houses that spend the night on the roof. So the next day they collected them. Of the 110 homes on the beach, 55 are completely destroyed. 37 people are dead, with 22 injured. Nine bodies are never recovered. Night watchman James Emmett and Mrs. Handel Hawkins are among the dead. So is Fred Downing and friend Jack Godden's wife and daughter. I think it would be hard because, it, you know, in a community like that, everybody knows everybody else anyway. You live in a big city, you don't even have to know your next door neighbor, but in a community like Britannia, everybody knew everybody 
and um, we're very close. At the inquest, civil engineers identify the railway embankment as the main cause of the disaster. Engineer George Haynes is one of the witnesses. The embankment had no margin of safety or engineering principle to it at all. If there was any seepage around the culvert, the least bit of signs of loosening of earth or material around, the whole thing would go. In its final verdict, the jury also cites company officials who built the embankment in the first place, including mine superintendent Carlton Browning. As part of the reconstruction of the beach community, a steel suspension bridge replaces the embankment and culvert across Britannia Creek. The mine continues to operate for another 50 years, finally closing in 1974. But for Carlton Browning, life after October 28, 1921, is never the same. It was a New York company, Britannia, and he had to go back to New York to be questioned. He was cleared of any negligence, but it haunted him throughout his life. Years later, he's still worried about, could he have helped it? <laughs>